Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the ENO Leadership Series. Uh, we are very excited uh, today to have Maggie Walsh joining us. She is the Vice President of Strategic Pursuits and Clients, Transportation, Transportation Business Line for HDR, and the current Chair of the WTS International. Um, we're very excited to have her here. She's a great partner of ENO's, um, and we know that well, not only can we learn so much from her, but we know that, that this industry as a whole can learn and everyone on this webinar. Um, so the way this is going to work is I'm going to turn it over to Maggie here in a moment um, and let her take it away on her leadership journey. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the question box. At the end of the session, I will moderate the, the question and answer period. And hopefully we get some good questions from the group uh, before the end of the call. So without further ado, Maggie, please take it away. Great. Well, it's just ter terrific to be here. And today, I'm going to take a little bit of your time to thank you for all of you who have dialed in to talk a little bit about my leadership story, some tips for executive success, and my outlook on some trends facing our industry. Before I move on, I just want to say a sincere thanks to the team at Eno to have created this opportunity to spend the next 45 minutes or 60 minutes uh, with all of you. So what an honor. So my career is a journey, not a destination. As you've heard, my name is Maggie Walsh, and I am uh, the a vice president at HDR. I uh, lead many, I'm trying to just take one moment here to just get into uh, advancing my slides. There we go. Um, so I'm a vice president at HDR, and I lead uh, a lot of our enterprise growth at the company through a focused attention on strategic clients and pursuits. So I get the opportunity to lead teams all across North America to secure new work by providing guidance and oversight and support to highly visible projects uh, around uh, um, that are game-changing in our communities. So with a keen focus on client development uh, across all the market sectors, including transit, freight rail, highways, bridges, aviation, maritime, we're able to understand the needs of our clients and deliver on those expectations. Every day I collaborate with marketing and operations, and in this, uh, this partnership, it helps strengthen our ability to assemble the best team, to uh, find the best talents and capabilities, and what I consider as the most transformative growth for our HDR employees. In addition to this fun role, uh, I also have the honor to serve as the chair of the board for WTS International. I was elected to the board in 2012, and I'm now in my seventh year on the board. Um, I've now taken the uh, position of ultimate responsibility for the organization. And I would say that since 1996, WTS has been a part of my professional life. The offering through the organization has certainly opened many doors for me, and I always look for those opportunities to walk through them. So while preparing for today, I was thinking about what would all of you want to hear? And I thought about the values that I, uh, that I base a lot of my life and my uh, decisions on. And so I thought of these four, being inclusive, being intuitive, having some fun, and using uh, some of my intelligence and wisdom to get me through all the challenges the world throws at me. So I, if I were to look at being inclusive, this is uh, extraordinarily important to uh, what I do every day. And I think that by uh, involving as many people into uh, into the decision makings and the project opportunities that we look at, it feels like we'll get to a better uh, a better uh, result based on opinions or ideas into everything. I think a lot about what even we're doing at WTS about being a very inclusive organization. Um, as you all know, both men and women are very important to uh, the mission of WTS. And if you don't know, I'll share that with you in a little while. 
I would say that being intuitive is really important to me. I've lived all over the world, and I would say my intuition really keeps me grounded and to make sure that I know when things feel right and when things don't feel right. And if they don't feel right, what type of course correction can I, can I create so that uh, the situations in which I find myself in or I find uh, my teams in or what have you is in a very uh, safe and comfortable environment. So I think intuition is really important. I can't overemphasize the importance of having some fun along the way. It's um, a way to just really keep the weight on your shoulders lifted. It's um, important to smile and have fun. You spend a lot of time with your colleagues and you spend a lot of time with other professionals around around uh, your companies or your agencies. And so uh, finding people that you enjoy to be around is really, really important. And I would say that uh, you sleep better and <laughs> You may think better if you just know that it's, um, you're having a little bit of fun along the way. And uh, certainly uh, the, the wise old owl, um, this is something that you know, I really value. I spend a lot of time investing into uh, who I am and what I have to offer. I, I've given a lot of thought about my, what my boundaries are, and I use uh, my wisdom where I can offer it, and I seek it when I need it. So I, I would say that um, if, if I want to be known for positive results, which is really important to me, I would say finding, uh, finding these values and everything I do is important. And if I could just offer to all of you that maybe um, finding your own values would be really important as well. So game-changing moments in my career. So I was thinking about this and thought, well, let me tell you about getting an MBA. So uh, not everybody uh, wants to get an advanced degree, but I decided that it was important. So I did. I, I, I have an MBA. And why I'm bringing this up is because I can't tell you how important it is to take uh, some time and invest in your own skills and capabilities. So um, I found that when I got my MBA, it looked like I had invested in me, which I did. And my company at the time asked me, what did I want to do with, the, with my MBA? And after several discussions, I was able to uh, um, write my own job description, find my own team and boss, and kind of set the parameters of what I was going to do for my next step of my career. And I felt like it was really all because I took the time to get some advanced um, knowledge with an MBA. Another game-changing moment is to really um, to take advantage of moments in time where you can actually do some major salary negotiations. So I know every year um, people have salary conversations with their, uh, their manager or their bosses. Um, what I'm talking about here is uh, I stepped into a, uh, I was asked, and uh, through my performance, I was asked to step into a bigger role. And with that, they gave me a small salary uh, uplift with that. And I took some time, a few hours, and really thought about this is the moment that I really, if I wanted to do anything about a major salary in pre, uh, negotiating program, this was the time. And I gathered uh, the evidence in which um, I could justify getting to a higher salary. And so I asked for the meeting with not only my own boss, but with several others who would have the influence to make the decision about a significant salary improvement. The point I'm bringing here is that not every year will you get a big salary uh, a lift. It's not the way the world works. But there are moments in time where you can take, a time, take the time to negotiate a new salary. Um, and the way to do it is to really have good, sound evidence and proof to uh, justify it. So uh, that, that was a game-changing moment. It also gave me my own confidence that I could do it and I could have that conversation because sometimes they're not very easy. And I was ready to also accept you know, defeat if, uh, if that was the case. And then the third game-changing moment is my will to move. So I had um, I've made some, some several moves in my life. Um, I have lived in Boston where I got my start in the, in the transportation career, and then I moved to Chicago, and, uh, and then I also took a position in the Middle East, which I'll talk about in a moment. But I had the will to move. 
I, I felt like it was the right thing to do. And if you have the opportunity to, to make a move where it won't feel as comfortable as you might think, um, really give it some consideration. And I will say this, um, that uh, people will move with you. So if you have a family and you have children, they will move with you and they will adapt and they will be a very, they will thrive in their new environment, mostly. Uh, but they, they can adapt. And so I guess what I would say with that on the will to move is, is to avoid some boundaries, um, some, or not boundaries, but barriers. So let's talk about, I was asked to share a few tips. And uh, so one, my first tip for you, I've got three of them. So my first tip for you is to um, invest in yourself. So you heard me talk a little bit about uh, what I did to uh, invest myself and get an MBA. I did that part time. And so I worked and got the MBA at the same time. Um, there was a lot that uh, went into that, both financially and my time. Um, but it was well worth it. So, and I'm not talking just always about graduate degrees. Take the time to find programs, to find conferences, to find seminars, ways that will um, impact your ability to advance uh, anything that you want to do in your career. But it usually takes some money. And so all of you make a salary, hopefully, and if you don't, you will. Um, use that money that you're making and invest in yourself. It's a valuable thing. I know a lot of people want your company to to invest in you and certainly ask and try to get that. But sometimes uh, it's important to just take, take some of your hard earned money and invest it in yourself. I think you're, uh, you will be rewarded greatly. Okay, so Libby, you heard me talk about living and working in the Middle East. I get this a lot. What was that like? Uh, I was a single female moving to the Middle East. And I'll tell you this, it was delightful. It was very challenging and intense and intense, but it was also delightful and fun and interesting and rewarding. The three things that I thought I'd share with you about this. Um, when I was there, I had to enhance our business presence. So we had to take some time and really look at the structure in which we were, um, we were using at the time uh, in the company and where did it need to go to really accomplish uh, what we wanted to be in the marketplace. So I, I took some time and I planned and I launched and then I led a marketing and communications organization for all the business lines across Europe, Middle East and Africa uh, for the company I was working with, which at the time was AECOM, small little company. But what it was is that there was some really uh, great opportunities that uh, we really wanted to capture, but it meant really uh, defining what our presence was like. So I needed a team to, to do that. At the same time that I was doing that, I was learning a lot about being in a cultural space. And this, uh, there were probably 80 to 100 cultures just in our office. And even the team that I offered, everybody came from a different space. So really learning about how culture influenced the way that we created the team. And here, even here in North America, where many of you will probably be working, it's important to really take a sense about what is the culture that you wanna live in and what is the one that you wanna create around you and bringing everybody's strengths uh, from their own cultures into that mix makes a big difference for empowering teams. So what found when I first got there is that there was just not a lot of empowerment. And a, link, a lot of it was is that people didn't have sound goals and what they wanted to do. And I found that actually what we really needed to do was upskill our team and our, and our, uh, our professionals. They were working with archaic uh, software systems. They weren't driven to really enhance what their skills were. And if they had better skills, their products would get better and actually their efficiency, efficiencies would go up. We spent a lot of time working on that. So I think this, um, this, the thing about living in the Middle East is that while it, uh, I spent some time in the desert, that's me on the camel in that picture, um, it's also pretty uh, forward thinking and it's modern and it's new and there's a lot of great stuff going on. Um, so we kind of had the dynamic of both. 
a little bit of old and a little bit and a lot of bit of new. Um, and I think a lot of that uh, really, um, I tried to understand what that meant and uh, drove a lot of what I did, my strategies and what, and how I, you know, led teams going forward. Had to incorporate all of that. Would love to take some questions about this from all of you as you're thinking about your questions at the end of this. Okay, that brings us to another uh, tip for all of you for executive success. I would say this is one of my favorite areas uh, to really hone in on. The power of saying yes to opportunity. Sometimes we search for opportunities and sometimes they fall right in front of you, but it's up to each one of us to grab a hold of it and do something with it. So we have to keep creating these opportunities so that we can say yes. And I would say this about opportunities. If all of us create opportunities for the people around us, behind us, and even in front of us, we will find more opportunities for ourselves. And I, I just know that this, this, is, uh, this is something that is really quite powerful and I would highly recommend reducing and eliminating as many barriers in front of you and really try to grab a hold of your opportunities. Okay, I'd love to just take a few minutes and talk about WTS. As the chair of this board, um, it's a pretty big honor to be leading a successful, engaging uh, organization with a ton of momentum and enthusiasm. In fact, we have 7,000 members maybe more. There are 57 professional chapters and 22, ch and 22 student chapters. Um, we ha have our chapters divided into six regions, and these regions are, are uh, led by councils, which are a direct line from uh, the local chapters into the international uh, board, in a sense, or at the international level. And so what we're trying to do is just create a sense of what our chapters need and how can we uh, better uh, deliver on, on items that the chapters need based on uh, what maybe a, a cluster of chapters need. So we're just trying to create some efficiencies there. And I would say that um, I have this picture here. It's a door opening. Um, again, just kind of what I just was talking about, about these opportunities. But I really do think that uh, WTS is a place where many doors can open for men and women um, to really uh, step through and, and do something with whatever it is they want to do with their life, their personal life, their professional life, however it works for them. Um, our mission at WTS is to attract, sustain, connect, and advance women's careers to strengthening the transportation industry. And my board, which is here in this picture, we're hard at work at enhancing this, this member experience. And uh, there are so many major initiatives underway. We're very excited about that. But in order to do this, uh, I, we can't do it alone. And so we found some great talent in, the, in, uh, in, in, in DC to really uh, take a hold of our organization and help us get to a spot that we think that we need to get to. So. We have hired Sarah Stickler, who I hope is listening in on this conversation. Sarah is our executive director. She came to us in October. She has jumped in and uh, has really uh, taken the organization, a, a big assessment of the organization, and has created some ideas on how to really advance where we're, where we're, uh, where we're going with this organization. And the importance of WTS in our industry is that many people well, 7,000, but even more than that, um, are, are connected to this organization and very personally or very professionally. And so we need to make sure that this organization continues to be that for so many and also to, be, um, to, to continue to evolve and uh, be something for everyone in our future. So to do this, Sarah has also been building a team in Washington, D.C., she, uh, she has a team that is hard at work every single day there in D.C. She's got April and Haley, 
Shelby and Stacy are pretty new, and Michaela is on board to really help uh, Sarah and our board and all of the chapter leaders across North America to really continue to make WTS a great organization. And uh, I just wanted to take a little moment to also highlight that WTS is a proud supporter of the Eno Center of Transportation because both of our organizations are cultivating creative and visionary leaders. And together, these organizations are uh, making our industry stronger. And what to take away from all of this is that I can't overemphasize the importance of getting involved. For our, all of you on this call, here are two terrific organizations, ENO, which hopefully some of you have been through their, their leadership program. Um, and some of you may be members of WTS, but there are many other organizations out there that, in the industry that may resonate with you at the time of wherever you are in, in your professional life. I recommend this, get involved, get on a committee, do something with that organization. You will be rewarded more than you will ever know. So my last tip is to be intentional. Say what you mean, and do what you say. We work in a team environment everywhere now, and we depend on everyone contributing. So when you make a thoughtful, distort, a thoughtful choice for the benefits of the greater good, you will own your own life and the space, and the space in which you live will be far more meaningful and rewarding. I encourage you to actively inter interact and engage with your life. I know that every day I wake up, and today I want to make it great. And so I need to be intentional. I need to know what I want to do, what I want to say, and commit to that. I would recommend you trying it on yourself. Okay, so enough about me. Let's talk a little bit about the transportation industry. It's a vast ecosystem undergoing what I like to call positive disruption. So according to KPMG, Transportation and healthcare are the hottest investments for venture capital. I don't know the numbers. I know it's well over, somewhere around in 2018, I think $70 billion were invested in these, in these industries. That's a lot of money. So what is that saying? So transportation in investments have evolved beyond ride hailing and autonomous driving stretching into multimodal transportation planning platforms, new energy vehicles, and smart trip technology. Let me say that again, multimodal transportation planning platforms, new energy vehicles, and smart trip technology. The reason why I bring that up is that uh, we are constantly looking at where we're going with all this technology. And rather than being overwhelmed by it, let it uh, embrace it and let it unfold. And if you're uh, in that business of technology, grab a hold of it. See what you can do to influence it. It's a great space right now. So we're seeing more and more people connect industries. So for example, I brought up transportation and, uh, and healthcare as being highly invested by our venture capitalists. So these two industries actually are getting more and more connected every day. The reason being is that healthcare providers need to improve their transportation network so that the people coming for healthcare reasons have an ability to get to and from their appointments. So for example, if you have some small or large impairment after your treatment, how are you gonna get home? Do we have a transportation network that will allow you to be mobile and get around? And that's a dependent on maybe a family member or others. So sometimes people have that and sometimes they don't. So I would say this, that uh, the opportunities to create um, this connection is everywhere. And so while I wrote expand, why I wrote expanding areas of fulfilling careers, we don't need just civil engineers. We need everybody. We need economists, planners, business development professionals. We need civil engineers. We need lawyers. We need communicators. Uh, 
we need lots of different people and their talents to come into this industry and really help propel it forward. It is a, a place that more and more people are finding their career home. And uh, so I encourage all of you to think about how your own talents and interests can be, uh, can find a spot here. And sometimes it's technical, sometimes it's not. I think with, um, with visionaries like Elon Musk, who has given our industry certainly a, a relatable connection, whether you want to go up in space or you want to take a tunnel between Chicago and O'Hare in 12 minutes, or if you want uh, to, to just simply um, look at how our communities are going to be built in the future. I would say that the, that the automobile is going to have a very, is going to continue to find limited spaces and that we're going to continue to build our communities where it feels healthier, where we're connecting the transit opportunities, the pedestrians, the bicycles, the scooters, everything into our streets um, in a very safe, uh, a healthy way so that the, the vehicle is going to slow down and we're, we're going to have a, a different way of, of moving around. So I think that, um, we have a lot to really look forward to in our industry, and it's pretty exciting, if you ask me. <laughs> okay. Um, so before we get to my last piece of this, of this presentation, I just wanted to take a small little moment to introduce a special guest who is here on the webinar. It is my twin sister. So Terry is um, on the webinar. She has had very little interaction with uh, me in my professional life. So this is exciting for her to see me in action. And I just wanted to, to say a few things. So one, I feel very fortunate that I have an amazing person in my life who looks just like me. But on top of that, uh, Terry is a leader in the not-for-profit arena. She has taken her career journey in working for uh, great institutions like Children's Hospital, the Boys and Girls Club, for the Boys and Girls Club, for the Ronald McDonald House. And she applies all of the knowledge that she's learned into not-for-profit organizations who need to develop major capital development programs so they can have a positive impact in our communities. So while we have sort of different uh, paths in our careers. We do have some similarities, not only in looks, but we do have this fond interest in uh, what our communities are shaping out to be, both from the, the space of what transportation does in our community and what uh, we do for enhancing children's lives in our community. So with that, I uh, zipped to that in about 30 minutes because I really wanted to take more time and hear from all of you. I'd love to hear about the questions that are on your mind and uh, what what is it that you want to talk about or what do you want to hear about? And I would love to get some ideas from all of you. So let's, let's hear what you have to say. Thank you, Maggie. Um, and just as a reminder, everyone, please type your questions into the question box, um, and we will make sure that uh, Maggie has the opportunity to answer them. Uh, I want to thank you, Maggie, for taking the time to talk to us. Um, and I realized I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning. So my name is Erin Shumate, and I'm the Deputy Director of Professional Development Programs here at ENO. Uh, so we're all very excited about uh, these leadership series that we're doing. Uh, so our first question for you, Maggie, uh, from the audience is, are there things that women leaders can or should be doing to help lift up other women in the field? Well, just that, support other women in the field. Uh, it's really, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would say this, women are always challenged in different ways. Sometimes they feel like they need to be someone who they're not in order to succeed. I would say own who you are, and when you're authentic to your own who, who yourself is, you will then bring others along with you. It's just a natural space that we have if we're authentic with who we, we are ourselves. I would say if a woman is struggling or if you're challenged with working with certain women, 
find out why, what is the root cause of it, and see if you can unearth or uncover why that is and help it align. Course correct it, give it a different direction. Um, sometimes just have an honest conversation, but if you're gonna have an honest conversation, I will say, be careful on that because the recipient may not be ready for that conversation. So figure out ways to have conversations that are going to be received in a way that you want it to be. Um, and sometimes you can use third parties. But I would say this. In terms of women, support them. Hold them up. Open up those doors. Remember I said uh, about opportunities, we've got to create the opportunities. Well, create these opportunities for women to step, step through. And uh, I would say this. Um, if someone else advances further than you, you're going to advance too. I, I don't know what else to say about that. Um, let someone go as far as they can and let, let them, you know, get out of their way. Otherwise, um, you know, in the end, it's not as fun, but be supportive. Great. Thank you. We've got a lot of questions coming in. Um, so okay, throughout sure. your presentation, <laughs> Throughout your presentation, you were really talking a lot about um, advancing your career through professional development and really reaching out and learning as much as you can. Um, what do you think and what kind of are you seeing in the industry as far as mentoring youth in order to choosing in professional transportation careers? Um, what advice do you have for organizations who want to start getting involved with that? Um, and what are you seeing happening around the industry? Okay, quite a few things. So m many organizations, uh, not only WTS, but APSA and ENO and others, reaching into the, the middle school, high school, college age, graduate college age, there's a lot of emphasis on that and it always can be more. Um, so what, what these uh, organizations are doing is that they're looking to uh, mentor them, to give them opportunities to show them what careers can look like in the transportation industry. So one of my favorite things about bringing uh, about youth is bringing them to an airport. And here's why. An airport is a small city. And in a small city, you need every single uh, um, you know, job needed. You need operations. You need marketing. You need legal. You need finance. You need accounting. You need engineering. You need planners. You need uh, you know, retailers. You need architects. You, you, know, you just need everybody. And so if you're looking to open some doors for our youth, take them to an airport and say, this is all that you have in front of you. Um, everything isn't about Google and Amazon. It's, there's a lot more and there's a lot of great opportunity, a lot of jobs for these youth to let them know that there's so, there's so many opportunities out there for them. They just are given the chance to see what else is out there. So I would, I would encourage that. I know at, at WTS, we have a, a nice, a transportation U program with uh, it's a connection into our USDOT um, agencies and specifically WTF hosts uh, what we call a DC summit. It's in June, end of June, and we bring 22 young uh, high school girls to DC for five days. They see air the airport, they see the USDOT, they get to go to uh, research facilities. They see, they have lots of mentoring one on one with uh, other professionals in the organization. It's a really great program, and I would imagine Eno is, you know, they're strengthening their their leadership programs. I know they focus on college and graduate ages um, as well. But but there's there's a lot going on. So uh, and everyone needs volunteers. So if you're looking to involve, uh, find an organization in your neighborhood and and raise your hand and offer to help. And I'm just gonna reiterate uh, what Maggie just said is if you, everyone needs volunteers. Um, I have volunteered for the Transportation U program in DC before, it's a wonderful program. So if you are in DC, I know WTS is always looking for extra help on that, um, as well as in their, their regional ones with their uh, regional WTSs. Um, in your presentation, you also talked a lot about really taking the time to invest in yourself. Um, and I'm curious, how do you manage that work-life balance um, when you're really investing in yourself and working 
And then you also have a life outside of that. How do you how do you really manage those things to to be as productive and as successful as possible? I think you want to decide what 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 is possible. So managing the life outside, I think the life inside is pretty cool. So when you're investing in yourself, you're learning, you're going to classes, you're going to to lectures, you're going to conferences or seminars or what have you, you're meeting people, there's always people there. So I would say the life is also there. And you're building your network and you're engaging with other people who are doing the same thing as you are and investing uh, in, their, in themselves. So I would say that, that there's a balance there in, in terms of are you letting go of something outside of, of this world or are you enhancing it by getting involved and investing in it. So I might look at that. In terms of workload balance, if you're doing it uh, full-time work and part-time education advancement, it's, it's a big lift. Um, stay healthy, eat healthy, uh, work out, stay healthy because your energy levels have to be high and you, you kind of have to really prioritize. This is a great a great way to learn how to get to efficiency and organization. You uh, will learn how to prioritize very quickly when you don't have that much time. So lots of people do the grids where you have what's important, what's not important, what's time sensitive, et cetera. So you know, there's techniques out there to learn how to prioritize your time. Sometimes you just have to let go of some things that you've always been doing. And that's part of growing and investing in yourself. So there is a way to balance it, but maybe change your mindset about what is it that you're gaining by investing in yourself, not necessarily losing. Thank okay. you. Um, I, I mean, someone put a comment in the question box, and I want to give you okay. a shout out for it. Um, Danielle Schroeder is in the, the call, and she's one of your Transportation New Mentors. And she attended the DC Summit last year, and she just wanted to attest yeah. it. What an amazing program it was. So I wanted to make sure that you you saw her comment. Um, and she actually has a question as well, um, which is, what advice do you have for young professionals just starting out in the field who are really still getting their feet wet and trying to learn what it is uh, the transportation industry is all about? Really two things. When you're asked to do something, do it. Learn it, do it the best you can. Sometimes it's not so much fun, but do it. Um, you're probably learning skills that you don't even know you'll need in the future. Um, when you're first starting out, sometimes things aren't glorious and exciting, um, but it leads you to something because you really need to build on the skills that you have. You've got great skills in terms of the education and the space that you lived in for the many years that you, where, you, where you got to to becoming a young professional. But now you have to use, uh, you have to learn the common sense and the living it space. Um, so I would say sometimes things are uncomfortable. Drive through it. Uh, keep your patience hat on, um, and know that by doing good work and by doing, um, you know, uh, working hard, putting the time in. And asking questions, uh, finding people to be your mentor, uh, and uh, just try not to complain. <laughs> you know, the work's got to get done. Um, we've we've all been there. And some of sometimes that will accelerate you faster into spaces that you want to get to. But I would say even today, I do a lot of administrative work. I it's not something that I always like doing. But uh, it's part of what we do every day. So I, I, you know, I get pretty good at it at it because I do it a lot. So sometimes that's just how it is. So for a young professional, um, keep a good attitude, work hard, ask lots of questions, and have some fun too. So don't forget that. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit of a piggyback off of that question. Um, there yeah. are five different generations in the workplace right now. 
um, from the, the very youngest to kind of those baby boomers on their way out. Um, what advice do you have for, for all of those generations in working with each other um, and getting through kind of the, the challenges and struggles that, that the different generations have in, in their work ways? You know, this is a place where, uh, so I did a lot of training uh, and I learned a lot about something called what we call people style. And so it, tells, it, it teaches you how to flex. And I would say, knowing who I am and how I flex to all the other characteristics and personalities out there. So some people, um, you know, in terms of generations, their levels of enthusiasm, their level of engagement, their level of all change. And all are different. And some of them are blended. Like there's unengaged people in younger ages and there's unengaged people in older ages. But um, my training has taught me how to flex to those people and to use my strengths to get them to, to work on whatever it is that we have in front of us. So if they're not working, I have to self-reflect and figure out a way to make it happen because it's no fun to be in a space where uh, not everybody's pulling their weight. And most people know what that means. So when it comes to generational management, it's almost the same thing. How do we flex? If, if people are uncomfortable with certain technologies, use something else that we need the, that uh, person for. Tap into their talents and skills. Encourage what they have. And in some cases, encourage them to learn. People can still learn all throughout their life. In fact, my mentor, who's now 78 years old, reinvents himself every couple of years. And he's still working and he's still doing a great job. Um, so, and I chalk it up to the fact that he watches trends in the industry and he just feel, figures out how to react to them. Uh, I appreciate that. Everybody will do that. But I would say figure out how uh, I myself, you yourself, uh, can use the strengths of your own personality to flex to another person. So I'll give you, for example, I might be known as more of an expressive. So I use my hands a lot. I might talk really fast. I'm uh, people-centered. I'm action-oriented. But for someone who is more analytical and uh, needs me, uh, doesn't really understand everything I'm saying because I'm talking really fast, I have to slow down. I have to sit on my hands. And I have to really communicate in a style that is received by that person. And I think that makes a big difference in how we can be effective in working together. So I, I do think that that's a good way of looking at generations, too, because everybody's driven a little bit differently. Karen. Thank you. Um, we've got another question, and it's, it's a little bit of a similar one to one earlier, but it's from the male perspective. Um, so the question is, as a male involved in the transportation industry, what can we do to be supportive of our female colleagues? Okay, so if you know me, uh, I always say how important men and women are in working together. We will come up with the best solutions if we're working together. So with, uh, from our male side of um, the gender species, being supportive of women, but if you don't appreciate where, that, where a woman's perspective is coming from, you know, ask or further get, get some more explanation or guide them into you know, re-expressing their, their uh, expectations or their ideas or their thoughts. Uh, don't push them away. Embrace them. And oftentimes, if it feels uncomfortable, you're probably doing a good job. But if you walk away and you don't do it, then, you know, that's a shame because we probably have a lost opportunity there. I will say this, that still today, probably 80% of a woman's career journey is going to be influenced by a man for giving them a promotion, for salary increase or a job opening, there's still, uh, still a lot of them are driven um, by men. And so it's up to us too as females to learn how to position ourselves 
so that we are noticed and we're recommended and that we are appreciated by them. So I think it's a little bit of a give and take. Um, you know, men can be a little bit more open to women and guiding them through or letting them know what they could do better. Uh, women could also do the same thing with uh, the men and say, it'd be really nice if you would consider me or open an opportunity for me instead of just the like looking people that, um, that are in the majority of office spaces and agencies and entities around the, around the state. So, we don't, you know, it's important. There's a balance out there, but there is a role and I myself embrace it. I think it's important that we have both, both and all genders. So today I think there's more than just two genders out there now and we have to embrace it all. All right. Um, there was a part of your presentation where you were really talking about kind of when you know when it's time to make a move or making a jump or taking a new opportunity. Um, how do you really gauge that timing in your career? Um, when do you know it's the right time to make that move, whether it's an actual physical move from location or a job move or a um, position move? Like, how do you really look at that and know when the, if it's the best timing? It's usually the scariest time when you're like, no, 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 I can't do that. When they call, when, when the executive team called me and said, hey, we have an idea for you. Why don't you move to the Middle East? And I laughed and I hung up because why would I come to the Middle East? <laughs> um, it was just unfounded. Like it wasn't even a thought in my mind. They called back and they said, no, we're serious. So, uh, so that felt really weird. And uh, I remember if Terry's on the phone, we were, we, we just couldn't believe like this is what I was going to do. And we had to research about where all the countries are and what was going on and what do you do there? Um, so it's usually the timing is usually not right and it feels uncomfortable and you will find uh, yourself putting up every barrier at that very moment is the exact time where you have to start saying no more barriers. and release yourself and say, what if I did do it and I did take it on? Who knows? It's usually where your opportunities are. When you can't see it, it's probably so close in front of you that that's exactly when you want to take it, when it feels uncomfortable. And then find your support network to, to say, if I fall, will you catch me? And if I don't, then I did the right thing. But uh, that's usually how I might look at it. Like, it's not going to be like, yes, Tomorrow, I'm going to wake up and I'm going to have this new job. <laughs> <laughs> um, as a piggyback off to that question, um, once you have decided to make that jump um, and you're starting to kind of look at what options are out there for you, um, do you think it makes or do you think you have really followed your passion for the work or being more true to your earning value and potential? Um, it's oftentimes that, that women uh, take jobs that they are not fully paid for or fully worth um, because they think they're qualified for them um, versus not trying to go for something that is a little out of their comfort zone um, and trying to make that stretch. Um, which, which one do you tend towards and what advice do you have for someone in that situation? Hmm. These, are, these are good questions, you guys. Um, okay. Let's see. Let me think about this one. Uh, earning potential. Uh, it depends on your decisions and what you're making. So if you feel like you took a job that you feel like you should have been making more, you know, there's, there's ways around that. Have the conversation. Um, I make my decisions really now around, you know, the environment and the people and all that because uh, I feel like I will – Deliver and I will be more productive if I'm in a space that feels healthy and supportive and with what I'm around. So I really look at the environment, the people who are in it, and you know what is that going to look like for me? Because every day I want to wake up and I want to work hard. Um, and I think when I when I have that mindset, uh, you know, I I got to more clarity about the value of what my earning potential could be. That takes a bit of time. But, uh, but I, I, I think I, I have a good sense about what that is. Uh, so I would say if you're toying with different decisions, um, sometimes you just 
take it, make it. If it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. I can't tell you, I can tell you 10 people right off the top of my mind who left a company and within a year came back. And sometimes they, you know, a little bit of their pride and is beaten down a little bit or they have to be very humble and come back. Um, but they took that, that, uh, that leap of faith at that moment thinking like that was the right decision because they couldn't see what was really uh, out there for them. And now they're, they're back in, in the space that they feel more comfortable in uh, with a, a greater appreciation of who they are and what they can contribute. So when it comes to women making these decisions, if you make one that doesn't feel all that great, take the time to change it. Um, and when it comes to earning potential, uh, it, it's a, it's a, it is an art to continue to focus on it and to work at it. It's uncomfortable for someone to go into a boss's office and say, I demand a job uh, increase because I'm a woman and I'm underpaid. I think we need to be a little smarter than that and we need to show why or have uh, just more information about that. Um, it's a longer story. We probably don't have all the time in the world here, but that is a good topic, and it's something that has some finesse to it, and uh, a lot of it, a lot of, um, I might say this, get some guidance, too, from your mentors or your sponsors. They, they would be able to help you. Maybe they do some research for you before you, before you step into making a decision, if any of this is making sense, but hopefully. It's a good, good question. Hard answer. Yeah. Um, our last question, at least from the audience, so if anyone else has any other questions, uh, feel free to write them in the question box. We do still have about eight minutes or so uh, before we have to wrap up. Um, but the, the next question is, do you see there being a glass ceiling for women in transportation? And if you see one, what do you think that is? I don't want any more glass ceilings, right? We just, we want to, I feel like different moments in life, we've shattered it and somehow it gets rebuilt. <laughs> so I would say that <laughs> organizations like WTS and ENO and others are creating ways to really, um, and, uh, to break down these, these fictitious kind of symbols that we have out there that they are out there, you know, we have our work cut out for us. Days, I think, I'm young enough. All these women were before me. Didn't they pave the way for me? I should be widening the path. And there are days where I'm like, I'm still creating the path. So I get that. Uh, but but I, I would like us to release our stranglehold on some of these um, symbols and really just try to keep propelling everything that we do. We know that when both men and women are involved in a decision, everything is better. We have more understanding of the complexity of whatever it is is in front of us, and we just get to a better solution. Sometimes it doesn't feel like the right one, but it's another solution that we can at least work towards. And you work towards Lots of solutions are not finite areas of life there for that moment in time, and you keep going forward. So on this glass ceiling element, that's the whole thing. We want to keep going forward. Our momentum in the industry is huge. You know, organizations, entities, companies, corporations, everybody has been giving a lot of attention to diversity and inclusion. That means so many different things to so many people. When it comes to women, there is an interest to really enhance who we are in our workplace, in our professional life, and it's up to us to really make a difference out of it. So let's shatter the glass ceiling. Let's find a different symbolism that really is motivating, is inspiring. And, you know, I'll tell you this, I'm very inspired by the WTS in the, um, vision. The vision is to achieve equity and access for all women in transportation. If we find equity and access for everyone, everyone wins. Let's go. Let's make it happen. Back to you, Erin. <laughs> 
Well, I think that's a that's a great note to end on. I'll just scrap my question. Um, <laughs> so I want no, it's all right. Um, I want to thank you, Maggie, and everyone on the line for attending today. Uh, these are quarterly leadership series that we do. So every quarter, you know, we'll put on a different webinar with a different transportation superstar. Um, we'll be sending out a, a link for a survey after this just to get your feedback and if you have any ideas for who you might want to see on these types of webinars in the future. Um, so be on the lookout for that. Um, again, thank you for your time, Maggie, and your openness and candor. Um, really appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to hearing from you and everyone on the call in the future. Thank you, everyone, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Sounds great. Thanks, Erin.